Japan, the land of the rising sun. In the country's storied history, there have been multiple instances of war. World Wars I and II are notable by their involvement, not to mention the still infamous nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, terrorism is another story. Terrorism attacks were so uncommon, Japan had no policies against them. It was that unheard of. They encountered the Japan Red Army, a militant group that operated from 1970 to 2001. But that organization was overt, much like the wars they fought, and the international community rooted them out. Little did the Japanese people know, a more sinister plot was brewing right beneath their noses in subway trains, neatly packed in bags with suspicious individuals standing around them. In one swift motion, a country's sense of peace and normalcy was ruptured. An invisible evil rose and changed the country forever. There had never been a toxic horror like that of Om Shinrikyo. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati. And today, honestly, the term corporate casket is taking on somewhat of a literal definition. Normally, before I encroach upon potentially traumatic content, I warn you so that you can skip it. Om Shinrikyo is a Japanese cult that transformed into an international terrorist organization. There's a good chance that the aforementioned content will dominate a large portion of today's conversation. So this is just more of an overall disclaimer. This episode is not for the faint of heart. I apologize if you were looking for something a little less volatile on your Wednesday, but it's just not going to happen. If you're not in the right headspace for this episode, I'd honestly encourage you to skip this one altogether. We have plenty of fascinating topics that I'd love for you to check out. And maybe this one is just not that one today. Om Shinrikyo, literally translated in Japanese as the Supreme Truth, began in 1987 with Chizuo Matsumoto. When he became the leader of the cult, he took on the name Shoko Ashihara. Since all of the infamous actions he committed were under his second name, I'll be referring to him by that name. But let's take a look into the leader himself to explore the roots of this organization. The history behind Asahara is somewhat tragic. He suffered from infantile glaucoma, causing him to be blind in his left eye and partially blind in his right. He began early education in a school for the blind where he was known for bullying and extorting other students. How does one person gain power in a school for the blind? Well, according to the LA Times, Asahara's poor eyesight was far better than the majority of his classmates. He graduated from school in 1975, and though the source doesn't state what time period he was in school, I'd assume that concerning school incidents occurred between 1965 and 1970. He used his slightly better vision to take advantage of those other students attending. His roommate said it was hell, the classmate said. He was always using people. One time after there was a burglary near the school, he ordered other boys to stay awake and guard the room while he was sleeping. Also, he would keep changing what he said. He'd tell someone not to do a certain thing and then right away turn around and order him to do it. Because people were afraid, they would obey. And then he'd get angry saying, why did you do something I told you not to do? The LA Times also cites an incident stemming around a strict curfew policy. Reportedly, he ordered his classmates to defy the rule, so much so that the dorm mother shouted at him to stop. His response to his supervisor's direct order was, I'll set this dorm on fire. Keep in mind that Asahara at the time was a child slash adolescent. We benefit from a culture nowadays that promotes being proactive when we see or hear troubling precursors. Unfortunately, that has come as a result of numerous tragedies that have hit us worldwide. It may be hard to imagine, but we used to live in a society that took these signs for granted. It would be easy to criticize the school, people, or community involved, but don't. This has all been taken in retrospect. The, how does the old saying go? Like the hindsight is 2020 thing? Like, yeah, we know now that these are worrying things, but back then we didn't. While the teachers did not throw this kid in jail, they addressed the concerns to the guidance counselor and the person attempted to take action. I wanna highlight in particular how Asahara responded in this case. When a guidance counselor tried to do something about it, Asahara said, all I did was say I would set a fire. It was just words. There's nothing for you to get all upset about. And you know what else he'd say? I'll shoot you to death. After saying that, he'd say, as long as I don't really shoot you, it's not against the law. I can say whatever I like. When he'd talk that way, the teachers were surprised and would say, it's scary, what will happen in the future? I remember well that there was talk like this. Two things. First, this is pretty much the literal definition of gaslighting. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, gaslighting is a psychological manipulation of a person, usually over an extended period of time that causes the victim to question the validity of their own thoughts, perception of reality, or memories. And it typically leads to confusion, loss of confidence and self-esteem, uncertainty of one's emotional or mental stability and a dependency on the perpetrator. 
While it was faulty, young Asahara certainly speaks in a way attempting to have someone question their ethics or sanity for that matter. Second, at least according to American laws, making violent threats is a crime. I'm not certain if it was in Japan at the time, but I assume it was not. But a quick cursory glance shows that Japan also indicts and jails people on assault charges. Now, for those of you that don't know, because it's important that you do, assault and battery are generally misconstrued for one another. Assault is the crime where physical pain is threatened to another person. Battery is the actual act of causing physical pain to another person. Saying, I'll punch so-and-so in the face is assault. Actually punching so-and-so in the face is battery. Both are crimes that should not be committed, but that's the difference. What made Asahara so polarizing in school was an alter ego, so to speak. There were times where he showed heartless cruelty and other times where he was sympathetic, particularly with the unpopular kids. According to the LA Times report, a young girl explained that while he showed some kindness, everyone was afraid of him. So basically it seemed like another manipulation tactic. I know earlier I said that we've come a long way in regards to acting on threatening language and mannerisms, but I do want to stress this again. If you ever encounter someone using language perceived as a threat to themselves or others, act on it. Tell someone you trust or an authority figure. I wouldn't go so far as saying things like school violence, workplace violence, or these terrifying organizations will be prevented, but there's a far higher chance for success and for preventing future issues if we do speak up. Now, all of this though, was just the beginning of Asahara's story. In 1977, he studied acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. It wasn't long after that he opened an acupuncture clinic. In 1978, he married Tomoko Akari Matsumoto, and they had six children together. Soon after, he opened a store where he sold Chinese medicines and miracle tonics. In 1981, Asahara was convicted of selling unregulated medicine and practicing pharmacy without a license. He was fined what amounts to be around $2,000 in today's value. Shortly after the legal troubles, Asahara tried to close his shop and declare bankruptcy. There is some resentment alluded to by his wife when referring to this incident. He and his wife resented the legal body that punished them, the police and the media they felt defamed them. It was a low point in his career that made a transition that changed the world forever. Following the turmoil, Asahara's focus changed. He developed a keen interest in religion and would often spend time studying different religious concepts. His studies included Taoism and Chinese astrology. He later started practicing esoteric Buddhism, esoteric Christianity, Western esotericism, meditation, and yoga. It was a catalyst for the new endeavor Asahara underwent. In 1984, the schoolyard bully slash failed pharmacist turned to religion, forming the first edition of his organization. It was called the Am Shinsen no Kai, which translates to the Immortal Mountain Wizard Association. This infamous organization was birthed as a yoga and meditation studio in a one bedroom apartment. There is little to no record of the years between 1984 and 1987. I've looked all over the place, but there's just not much information available. Considering what followed, I'm inclined to believe that this group or organization was highly successful. In 1985, the tomfoolery began. And as always, I'm not going to tell you like to what to believe in or how to believe it. Everyone's got the right to believe in what they want. Now, this was the year that he claimed the ability to levitate in the twilight zone. like. That's the thing. Now, the length of time I can levitate is about three seconds, but this period of time is gradually lengthening. An article quoted Asahara as saying, in about a year, I should be able to fly freely through the sky. Apparently he developed the ability to grow wings and fly, or better yet, he's become like a super saiyan and we're all living in a real Dragon Ball Z world. The following year, according to materials published by his sect, he visited the Himalayas and achieved ultimate salvation. And the next year, he claimed to have received secret teachings of Tibetan Buddhism directly from the Dalai Lama. There were also claims that he could see through walls as well as meditate underwater for six hours. Now, if you didn't know, the world record for holding your breath underwater is 24 minutes by Budimir Syobat. And before that incredible feat was done, he hyperventilated on pure oxygen. Multiplying a feat that's never been done by more than 12 times, That's why I personally call the claims tomfoolery. Now, despite all of these notions outlandish in any time period, he changed the organization's name to Am Shinrikyo in 1987. This also commenced his campaign to register his organization as an official legalized religion. This process was a bitter battle between Asahara and bureaucrats in Tokyo's city government. But in 1989, Am Shinrikyo won their campaign and became a legally recognized religion. This was also the time the organization ran into its first wave of controversy and of crime. But before we get into that, we're going to examine the religious development of the quote unquote supreme truth. 
Am Shinrikyo is an amalgamation of different religions. Asahara took elements from Buddhism, particularly Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, and combined it with teachings from Nostradamus and millennial Christianity. Some mild elements of Hinduism were included and Shiva was one of the primary deities worshiped by the Supreme Truth Seekers. To be honest, I'm not quite sure what uh, to call the members. So we're just gonna go with Truth Seekers. As the religion grew in number, it grew more extreme. I found a number of quotes from Asahara and members of the cult that shed light on their culture. Let's see what Amshinrikyo has to say as it entered the realm of an organized religion. I think we are the most scientific of religions. This was from a TV interview in 1989. Now, that's not necessarily the like most wild thing to say. Any religion has the right to claim the, to be the most of literally anything, the most devout, the most scientific, the most modern, etc. I wouldn't say this statement warrants any kind of negative feedback, but let's take a look at the next one. Training that doesn't lead to supernatural powers is hogwash. The venerable master will show you the secrets of his amazing mystic powers. Seeing the future, reading people's minds, making your wishes come true, X-ray vision, levitation, trips on the fourth dimension, hearing the voice of God, etc. It will change your life. And this was an advertisement for Asahara's book, Secrets of Developing Your Supernatural Powers, also in 1989. That advertisement harkened back to his 1985 claim of having uncanny abilities. While this falls into the more extreme category, it's not surprising to hear either. I will say I can see how people were drawn into this fear. Offering people the idea of becoming empowered or ascending to another physical, mental, or spiritual level is common for entrancing prospects. I mean, we, and I mean we collectively, constantly search for some sort of purpose or enlightenment. It's just human nature, especially as we get older. Yet claiming to fly and seeing through walls are more akin to comic books than reality. But take a look at the people Asahara interacted with. From birth, he was dealt unfortunate circumstances, but he asserted emotional control over a group that was largely even less fortunate than he. Now, I don't feel it's a stretch to say that this now religious leader targeted people who were impoverished or suffering. In Secrets of Developing Your Supernatural Powers, Asahara also promotes eating healthy, reasonable exercise, and good rest. So who's gonna argue with that? Many times people in organizations will mix truths and falsehoods together to override their target's sense of logic. Here's a quote that really pushes that envelope. I hereby declare myself to be the Christ. Incidentally, there is something I feel keenly when I read the Bible. It is the inaccuracy of the wording. This is the very reason why the beings who practice Christian teachings do not understand the true meaning of the Bible, hence are unable to practice the right way, the path to attain the holy heaven. And you're not hearing that wrong, nor are you mistaken. In this relatively new religion, this man claimed to be the Christ, as in the Christian Christ. He went from having the ability to fly and see through walls to proclaiming to be the sacrificial lamb that atones for the sins of people, the Protestant symbol of spiritual and moral perfection. Now, I do wanna be fully clear on this statement. Asahara was meaning this in the most literal of definitions. I find it interesting that this man was so easily traversing across different doctrines to come to this conclusion, that there is a Christ in a religion that worships Shiva. If you're getting lost in the explanation, don't feel bad, it is a mess. Shortly after Om's leader claimed to be the Christ, he adopted more Christian doctrines, specifically referring to the end of days. Many people know about it, but if you don't, the end of days is an event predicted in the book of Revelations in the Bible, particularly chapter 16. This chapter depicts the concept of a final battle between the forces of good and evil that permanently decides the fate of non-worldy realms of all people that are alive. It's pretty similar to the concept of Ragnarok in Nordic mythology. The Christ reveal is the particular point where Om Shinrikyo transitioned from eccentric religious sect to doomsday cult as they're so often tabbed. The following quote is showing how the movement intensified. And this is a speech that was given to the followers of this group. Four days ago, while on the astral plane, I had a vision I was absorbing radiation. I was experiencing the nuclear war that will inevitably occur between 1997 and 2001. Without doubt, the final war will occur and it will happen between 1997 and 2001. Where will it happen? That will be the Middle East. The Gulf War was a forerunner to it. Now, this could be considered a development from Nostradamus' teachings in Christian New Testament scripture, but I believe it coincides more with Y2K. And (sighs) it's been a while since I talked about it. But to keep it short here, there was an unsupported fear that since computer dates were measured in double digits instead of four, they wouldn't be able to function. There was also the fear that planes would crash all over the world. And yes, nuclear bombs too. When Asahara was speaking about radiation, I think it's more of what he was referencing. It's noted that Am Shinrikyo was convinced that the nuclear tragedies would occur more between 1996 and 1998, not the 2000 prediction. This is something their leader claimed in a 1992 lecture at Osaka University. Even considering the time period, I'm surprised that they permitted him to speak at a college. I believe that in the end, a super big laser gun will be developed. 
When the power of this laser is increased, its contents are converted to plasma. Thus, a perfectly white belt or sword can be seen. This is the sword reference to in the book of Revelations. The sword will destroy virtually all life. Now, I was joking earlier when I made the Dragon Ball Z reference, but this person really sounds like they're reading a lot of Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, Tenchi Muyo, maybe an early vision or a version of Yu Yu Hakusho. I, I don't know. Now, granted, many mangas take their inspiration from the Chinese novel Journey to the West, and I'm not going to make light of Eastern Shinto mythology, but when your doctrine is synonymous with violent mangas, the topic goes from slightly amusing to slightly terrifying. And terrifying is an appropriate word here because this is what this Supreme Leader said following an attack on the Tokyo subway. Disciples, the time to awaken and help me is upon you. I am waiting for you to become my hands, my legs, my head, and help me accomplish my salvation plan. Let's carry it out and face death with no regrets. Now, despite the disclaimer, we've avoided most of the violent stuff to this point. I'm gonna go ahead and stick to the disclaimer I made at the beginning of the episode. There are people out there who could be triggered by threats of arson or mass shootings as Asahara did in his childhood. But in either case, I'm giving you yet another heads up. If you've made it to this point and you're like, I'm kind of uneasy, then this is, this is the stopping point. It's gonna get a little bit more violent as we move forward for everyone who is staying and continuing on. Um, Shinrikyo hid their violent actions as long as they could, but soon after the apocalyptic proclamations, they went on the attack. So let's discuss that. Acts of violence from Om Shinrikyo date all the way back to the 1980s. They were accused of abducting cult members, forcing them to pay for membership, aka extortion, and allegedly murdering two members who tried to leave in February, 1989. Around the same time, Om Shinrikyo had a dispute with then lawyer Tsutsumi Sakamoto. Already known for taking down Japan's unification church, Sakamoto had his sights set on Om Shinrikyo amid the aforementioned rumors with public relations tactics. Riding the momentum from his UC victory, he started the initiative Coalition of Help for Those Affected by Am Shinrikyo. He aimed to prove the accusations true, that members were being coerced and that high priced religious items were exploiting members. You know, all these incidents stem back to reported habits from Asahara's childhood. You remember all the threats of starting fires and shooting people? Well, they didn't simply remain threats. This disturbed young person became an even more disturbed adult, but back to the lawyer. On October 31st, 1989, Sakamoto received blood from Asahara. You see, Asahara claimed to have special abilities resonating in his blood, more superhero rhetoric I see, and the cult leader aimed to prove it. Sakamoto had the blood tested and you're going to be stunned by the results because it was ordinary human blood. I know, you're shocked. But Am Shinrikyo didn't take too kindly to the threat of this lawyer defaming them and exposing the truth. Soon after, Sakamoto went on air with the Tokyo Broadcasting System about his efforts to take down the cult. He was planning on putting forward a class action lawsuit. If successful, he would have drained all their resources and possibly forced them to disband, but he didn't get the chance to. TBS showed the footage to Am Shinrikyo members, which violated confidentiality laws and Am pressured TBS into getting rid of the footage. I'm going to describe the following as briefly as I can. And again, violent traumatic content. On November 3rd, 1989, multiple members of Am Shinrikyo entered Sakamoto's house. They hit him in the head with a hammer, poisoned his wife and 14 month old son with potassium chloride. Sakamoto's wife died from the poisoning. They suffocated his son and they beat and strangled Sakamoto. The sources taken go into specific details about the incident, but honestly, I, I think that general statement I just made pretty much covers it. Their remains were placed in metal drums, which were hidden throughout the city. Tokyo authorities did actually investigate the murder, but there wasn't much they could do outside of their jurisdiction. According to research done by Ethan Biondo, there was allegedly another man who was murdered for trying to leave, but there again, isn't much information surrounding that. Considering what I've discovered so far about this organization, I honestly assume it's true, though I haven't seen evidence supporting this specific accusation. There is a natural progression in the cult that grew steadily more violent, and it's not without cause. Ethan also said, Asahara taught his followers that non-members of Om Shinrikyo would be destined for hell, but could be saved if they were killed by a member of the cult. So this individual achieved enlightenment from the Dalai Lama because the Christian Christ, the figure who saved people from sin by becoming a living sacrifice had superpowers, but the only way that non-believers would be saved if they were killed by a member of the cult. Does that make sense to you? Are we following along? Because that's kind of where we're at. In 1990, Om Shinrikyo registered 25 members for the national diet election. And this isn't some sort of health group. 
the national diet election would be the equivalent of the United States House of Representatives or whatever national lawmaking body presides over your country. By this point, Am had risen to tens of thousands of members branching all over the globe. It makes sense that they felt empowered enough to enter into the realm of politics. Politics and governing are different skill sets than any other occupation. We have seen this in the United States with Mehmet Oz trying to transfer his medical skills to politics or Arnold Schwarzenegger transferring movie stardom to politics. The mechanic is good with their hands, but that doesn't mean you should trust them to do brain surgery. The same goes with running an organized religion and entering politics. Skills and abilities are not universally equivalent. Their governing pursuits did not go the way they expected. Asahara himself ran, but totaled less than 2000 votes and not one of their members were given a seat in government. Asahara was incensed, blaming Jews and Freemasons for the loss. There's nothing suggesting that they were the reason, but when you're, you know, kind of in the headspace that he's in, you don't really need evidence if you get where I'm going. After the election, the cult became increasingly more violent. That's an accomplishment considering how horrible they were already. They quickly amassed a hit list, including critics like the leader of Soka Gakkai and the Institute of Human Happiness. I bet they had plenty of tea. The group tried to murder cartoonist Toshinori Kobayashi after he made a satirical comic of them. They really had, you know, no shortage of being able to look bad and they did it a lot. In 1992, the first evidence of what most recognize as terrorist activity took place. In October of that year, Asahara took 40 of his followers to Zare with the claim that they were helping Ebola patients. This is suspected that the group actually went to procure an actual virus for malicious purposes. In this article, Ethan claims that by 1992, the group had participated in at least 10 chemical attacks, including the attempted assassinations of Ryuho Okawa and Daisaku Ikeda. This is the one claim from the writer that I was unable to corroborate, but with the rest of their information being verified and the violent history of Am's founder, it wouldn't surprise me if this also turned out to be true. In the summer of 1993, the cult launched two separate attacks. The first attack was an attempt on Prince Naruhito's wedding targeted at the members. Using a car, they attempted to spray botulinum toxin in the air. They aimed to kill attendees and blame the United States. Remember when I said they believed Armageddon was coming? It appears they were trying to create the conflict and blame the United States for it, but it didn't work. The chemical they sprayed was not stable enough to achieve their goal. And while the guests complained about it, no one suffered any damage. It was at this point in time that the cult realized they wanted to make their chemical attacks more potent. They focused on developing sarin and VX gases, two poisons that would help them achieve their future goals. Around the same time, Om launched yet another attack on the public, this time spraying Bacillus anthracis, hopefully I said that right, from the roof of the new Tokyo headquarters. And they actually did this twice. They again were testing the viability of their chemicals and trying to create aggressive propaganda between America and Japan. Now, most of us are familiar with Bacillus anthracis at this point because it's anthrax, the chemical found in mail parcels shortly after 9-11. For the most part, the United States blamed Al-Qaeda for the anthrax attacks, but here is an instance where it was used before it received heavy national attention. 1993 was the year of failed terrorism for Am Shinrikyo, but 1994 was a year of catastrophic success. As we prepare for Asahara's worst, I have to say he reminds me a lot of Elijah Price or Glassman from the movie Unbreakable. You see the signs of Price's villainy throughout the entirety of the movie, but it doesn't really hit until there's a disaster. Now, although I wouldn't say they're exactly alike, I would say, you know, throughout this episode, I'm constantly reminded of the fire threats and shooting threats he made as a child and how those evolved. In May, 1994, Am released a sarin, a nerve toxin into the ventilation system at Taro Takimoto as he was driving in Tokyo. Takimoto was a lawyer that was helping teach people to escape the cult and the cult tried to take him out in retaliation. Takimoto was listed as a casualty, but the nerve agent actually caused nerve injury and sight issues instead of killing him. Vision issues was a horrible twist of irony. Following the month the cult released sarin again, this time in Matsumoto, Japan. Using a refrigerator truck, the attackers expelled the gas all throughout a particular neighborhood. They targeted a number of judges overseeing a land dispute that was projected to go against Am Shinrikyo. It resulted in devastation. 500 people were injured by the gas and eight were killed. In an unfortunate turn of events, Am wasn't implicated in the incident. In fact, an innocent survivor was actually targeted by the police. The cult's attacks were intensifying at a rapid pace. In September of the same year, they tried to kill journalist Shoko Igawa, who was covering the disappearance of Takamoto. A month later, they killed 20 members as punishment for opposing Asahara by poisoning them with VX gas. 
In November, 1994, they tried to kill a man who was allegedly aiding former OM members. And in December, they killed a man who was spying on their organization, both using VX gas. January of 1995, they tried to kill the leader of the OM Supreme Truth Victims Group. In February, they went after the Institute of Human Happiness again. That same month, they murdered the brother of a member that escaped. Now, at this point, you would think that they would be like being investigated or put behind bars or something. Authorities planned a raid of all of Am Shinrikyo's facilities to put an end to their terror. And to be honest, I was surprised that they were allowed to get this far. There's an old saying where there's smoke, there's fire, but it's really surprising that these folks were constantly able to walk around with metaphorical blow torches. There was always fires with Am. But to be fair, Japan had little history with dealing with localized terrorism. So this was an entirely new adversary. And to their credit, Japanese authorities had a plan, unfortunately. The plan was too late. Before we continue on to Am Shinrikyo's final kind of large attack, which is the subway attack, I'm gonna go ahead and place the sponsor here. It's not gonna get, like I said, much better when we return. But again, another moment of pause before we jump right back into the terror and onslaught of this group. Thanks to 7% inflation, everything costs a gazillion dollars right now. So it's a relief to find savings where you can, and you can find it with Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is the first wireless company to sell online only, and their lack of overhead translates into serious savings for you. And when I say serious savings, I mean serious. Their plans start at just $15 a month, and all their plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data, all delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. With Mint Mobile, you can choose the amount of data that's right for you and stop paying for data you don't use. I've been using Mint Mobile now for a year and a half. Maybe we're getting close to two years at this point, And I have had zero problems. It's actually been kind of shocking. The bill is easy to control and maintain through their app and pay and upgrade or downgrade depending what I'm doing. And there's literally no issues ever. It's kind of shocking that it's so good. Like why isn't everyone doing this? Anyway, to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. It seems like we've all been really focused on sleeping lately as well too, because no one is sleeping well. But no matter how many tinctures you might buy, nothing helps more than just getting a better mattress. That's why it's worth getting a purple mattress. Only purple mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid, which is a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat. Might I add, doesn't retain heat. You sleep nice and cool on this thing all night. The Gel Flex Grid supports your back and legs, yet also cushions your shoulders, neck, and hips. Since switching to a purple mattress, I've noticed that Casper, which as you guys know, is a Samoyed who is an Arctic sledding dog. So he needs to maintain cool temperatures. He's been sleeping on the corner of the purple mattress with me. So I assume it most certainly keeps him cool as well, which makes me happy. And you can try your purple mattress risk-free with free returns and shipping. Financing is available too. So getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. So get a purple mattress. Make sure you go to purple.com slash casket and use code casket. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket, code casket for 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket, promo code casket, terms apply. Two major incidents took place in March, 1995. The first was on March 15th. Three briefcases were placed in a Tokyo subway station. They were supposed to relieve botulinum toxin, but a dissident had replaced the contents with water. That person saved many lives. And I'm sad to say it wouldn't surprise me if that person paid for that with their life. It was only five days later when a total of 11 cases were placed at the subway on five separate trains. At predetermined stops, the sarin packets were ruptured with the tip of a sharpened umbrella carried by each cult member. The perpetrators would then exit the train to meet a getaway car. The sarin would leak out of the punctured packages, quickly evaporating into gas and spreading throughout the train car, coming into contact with passengers, subway workers, and passerbys. This was an act of true terrorism. The sarin release hospitalized over 5,000 people and killed 12. Nearly 500 suffered significant injuries. This was one of the largest terrorist attacks in Japan's history. 
the magnitude of the attack changed how Japan viewed chemical warfare forever. I mentioned the anthrax attack and how it related to the United States. And the 1995 sarin attack had an equivalent impact being of even greater consequence. Om would consider this one of its crowning moments. And it also became the catalyst of the cult's downfall. The police launched their raids shortly after the subway incident. Instead of deterring the authorities from their suspicions, the chemical warfare exacerbated it. Over the next week, the full scale of Om's activities was revealed for the first time. At the cult's headquarters in Kamikushiki on the foot of Mount Fuji, police found explosives, chemical weapons, and Russian Mil Mi-17 military helicopters. While the finding of biological warfare agents such as anthrax and Ebola cultures were reported, those claims now appear to have been widely exaggerated. It was ultimately reported that Am Shinrikyo had enough chemicals to kill 4 million people. As the raids raged on, Asahara went into hiding and 150 of his acolytes were arrested. Am Shinrikyo lost its status as a religion and many of the members were prosecuted. But the leader of the cult could not hide for long. On May 16th, the Am Shinrikyo headquarters were investigated with a court order for Asahara's arrest. He was found in a small room disconnected from the rest of the facilities. He was indicted 13 times and charged with 27 counts of murder. What followed was what many in Japan considered the trial of the century. My name is Shoko Asahara. I have abandoned that name, Asahara said of his legal name, Chiuzo Matsumoto, at the first hearing of his trial in the Tokyo District Court on April 24th, 1996. I am the leader of Am Shinrikyo, he added, declaring himself the founder of a religion. On April 24th, 1996, that's how it began. The cult leader started off as a proud figure actively participating in legal strategies. The official litigation spanned 257 hearings over seven years, but the case felt closed early on. In the eighth hearing of September, 1996, Asahara's acolytes testified, confirming that he was the one who issued the orders. The following month, he tried to block the cross-examination of one of the perpetrators of the Tokyo subway attack. He actually threatened his court appointed lawyers if they were to cross-examine the member. It's theorized that he was trying to protect the person, but it seems clear that Asahara was more concerned with protecting himself. Through this particular incident, the cult leader continued claiming his innocence as well as his divine status, but it made little difference. Evidence quickly mounted over his involvement that the incident as well as the Masumoto attack. As the case continued, it was clear that the Christ was losing the case. He resorted to being disruptive and belligerent. The founder took the stand himself on April of 1997, the 34th hearing. He admitted to being involved with the cult throughout the criminal activity period, but he denied being directly involved. He even claimed to order on members to stop the gas attacks, but the hundreds of voices of his followers outweighed his own. The counter argument is the exact same rhetoric he used when he was in school threatening arson or gun violence. Misdirection, gaslighting in defense, using gas in attacks, there's a recurring theme here. There is no reason to believe anything other than Asahara ordered every attack. It took his entire life to finally be held accountable. It took a lot of damage to get there. There isn't a point where Asahara admits to being involved with the heinous crimes, but it doesn't matter. He was the leader of Am Shinrikyo. Regardless of whether he placed the bag in the train car or not, he's responsible for the acts of the organization. After that particular hearing, Asahara resorted to being disruptive and causing outbursts. Now the reports indicate that he lost interest in the case, but I don't think that was true. While I wouldn't say the man's marbles were all in one place because they clearly weren't, I would suggest that his actions in court were deliberate, not to mention out of court. Now, some interesting things that he did during the trial were like weird. They were just, I don't know, maybe that's not the right word, but they were strange. Like he never used the toilet. He wore a diaper throughout the entire court process in addition to the 10 additional years that followed. On the day of sentencing, February 27, 2004, the courts handed down the death penalty over a grueling four hour period. There are conflicting reports. Some say that he remained silent. Some articles reported that he was disinterested or disconnected, even snickering and smirking throughout the ruling. The police raided the offices in 2006 when the final appeal was denied by the courts. The courts found him guilty, death penalty, he's dead, the end, right? Well, not entirely. We're going to start this by jumping forward a bit. Asahara was convicted in 2004, but he was not actually executed until the summer of 2018. There was a sense of relief in the Japanese community. 
Japan's crime levels were not relatively high, certainly not publicized to the levels of the United States. I mean, here we had, you know, California gang wars, the attacks of the World Trade Center prior to 9-11, Chicago's constant urban violence. That was something not really present in Japan, or at least not publicized. Am Shinrikyo rocked that country with undeniable terrorist activity in a way that was unprecedented. Shoko Asahara was indeed dead, but somehow this organization not only outlived him, but it's actually still alive today. Enter Aleph. Asahara's kids took the leadership role and changed the name from Am to Aleph. Why in the world a terrorist organization wasn't completely rooted out after the subway attack is tragic. I'm not going to criticize them or anything, especially considering Japan is unfamiliar with terrorist organizations. You can only hope their experiences have prepared them better for the future. In 2007, a former member branched off from Am to start the organization Hikari no Wa, meaning the Circle of Light. Just like Aleph, the Circle of Light aimed to repair the image and focus on the spiritual side of their movement. They couldn't be called a religion anymore, but they were still in operation. But Aleph is the true descendant of Am Shinrikyo. In 2017, police raided the group now known as Aleph, allegedly recruited and collected tens of thousands of yen in membership fees from a woman in February without having her fill out the legally required paperwork. The police believe Aleph has been luring young followers without disclosing that it's a religious group and without informing them of its links to Am and its criminal history. According to the police, there were about 1,500 Aleph followers across the country last year. It looks like Am Shinrikyo has been alive and well, just under a different name. In 2019, Kazushiro Kusakabe retaliated to Asahara's execution by hitting nine people with a car in Tokyo. Aleph didn't have any sort of reported relation to the incident, but it has to be a frightening symbol to Japan and Tokyo at large. This is yet another example of a charismatic leader who created a terrorist organization that does not go down easily or quickly. We have seen this in cases with Al Qaeda, we've seen it with ISIS, and if history teaches us anything, we can expect to see it with Aleph, formerly Am Shinrikyo. If I can say anything to you and the viewers worldwide, Always do whatever you can to stay safe, care for one another, and for goodness sake, take early signs seriously. If you see something, say something. But with all of this being said, this is where we're going to end today's episode of one of Japan's most terrifying cults, I'm Shinrikyo. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really appreciate your time here with me today. I know this was a bit of a longer one, but it was a lot that needed to be covered. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 